look at some of the UK traditions and some of their government structure here, uh, and then take a quick look at some of their prime ministers of the past. So, the creation of the UK, uh, sometimes we call it the Constitution of the Crown. The UK has never had a written constitution. It's kind of evolved over time. There's different important documents. They use common law, uh, different customs uh, to form what they call the Constitution of the Crown. One of those documents is the Magna Carta. So again, in 1215, King John signed this document, um, consulting with a lot of the nobles uh, to make sure that his decisions were agreed upon with the nobles, um, especially when it came to taxes. Uh, so it forms a base of limited government that the governments are not all too all powerful uh, and put some restrictions on the monarchs at that time. Another one of those documents is the Bill of Rights. So William and Mary uh, signed this in 1688. Again, it's important policy making, belongs to Parliament, not uh, to the monarchs. Uh, and it included the power of the purse, meaning they could regulate the money and where money was going. Uh, the UK has what is known as common law. So it's the legal system based on local customs and precedent rather than formal legal codes. So again, it's kind of adjustable. You're looking at uh, court decisions um, and the decisions made by public officials to later affect actions uh, that are occurring at that time. Uh, again, it kind of forms a comprehensive set of principles for the government uh, rather than just having strict uh, legal codes, which is known as cold law. The UK uh, follows what is known as noblesse oblige, and they feel this is kind of the duty of the uh, more wealthy or upper class to take care of the lower class, uh, kind of like a social welfare. Uh, again, the upper class uh, is sometimes associated with the conservative party, uh, and this comes from the feudal times where the lords would protect the individuals working for them, the serfs on their land. Um, the UK is a very accepting welfare state. And again, an example of this would be the National Health Service. The UK also has the idea of gradualism. Okay, So political change um, is slower and gradual in nature uh, in the UK. Um, in this uh, scenario, we have the House of Lords. So, for example, in 1066, it was created to gain support of the noblemen. So the monarch created this House of Lords to get some support from the people uh, around him. Uh, and then the House of Commons was created as different smaller towns in the middle class emerged to gain some more support uh, and also to have more people involved in the policy-making decision. But they have a lot of slow change because they have really, really strong traditions. All right, looking at some of the prime ministers, one of the most influential is Margaret Thatcher, also known as the Iron Lady, 1979 to 1990. Um, UK was in an economic decline when she came to power. Uh, the UK government was under labor leadership and was going towards socialism, uh, and Thatcher was not... Um, didn't want any part of that. So Thatcherism is a neoliberal idea, okay, um, and it's a revival of the kind of classic liberal values that we've talked about uh, in the introduction unit. So the idea of freedom um, for everyone as far as economic and political rights. Uh, they all want the low levels of government regulation, taxation, um, and they want to protect your individual property rights. Okay, so they're kind of anti noblesse oblige um, in that conservative party where they don't really want the government to help people. Um, they want the government to do less. So neoliberalism in action, again, it would be, Thatcher would be an anti-socialist, um, wanted to get rid of these trade unions, really wants to protect the business and business owners. Um, again, she was able to then kind of get rid of some of the power that the Trade Union Congress had at this time. Uh, and here's an example of Thatcher talking about socialism. I give way to the honorable gentleman. 
individual fit sleep. There is no doubt that the Prime Minister has in many ways achieved substantial success in the economy. Yeah. 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 There, is, there is one statistic that I understand is not, however, challenged, and that is that over her 11 years, the gap between the richest 10% and the poorest 10% in this country has widened substantially. How can she say at the end of her chapter of British politics that she can justify many people in a constituency such as mine being relatively much poorer, much less well housed, and much less well provided than it was in 1979. Surely she accepts that is not a record that she or any Prime Minister can be proud of. Mr Speaker, all levels of income are better off than they were in 1979. But what the Honourable Member is saying is that he would rather the poor were poorer, provided the rich were less rich. That way you will never create the wealth for better social services as we have. And what a policy. Yes, he would rather have the poor poorer, provided the rich were less rich. That is the liberal policy. Yes, it came out. He didn't intend it to, but he did. I give way to the Honourable Jim. I'm extremely glad. The, the, the Prime Minister is aware that uh, I detest every single one of her domestic policies and I've never had that. And I think that the Honourable Gentleman knows that I have the same contempt for his socialist policies as the people of East Europe who have experienced it have it on I think I must have hit the right nail on the head when I pointed out that the logic of those policies are they'd rather have the poor poorer. Once they start to talk about the gap, they'd rather the gap was that. <laughs> Down here. That. Not that. But that. So long as the gap is smaller, so long as the gap is smaller, they'd rather have the poor poorer. You do not create wealth and opportunity that way. You do not create a property-owning democracy that way. All right, so that was her kind of take. It was kind of a fun take where she used those hand motions there to show that socialism would just make the country poorer, um, where her policies were allowing the country to grow in wealth. Uh, here's an example of uh, just some strife and some things that occurred in the UK in 1984-85 coal strike. Uh, there was a coal mining that had been nationalized in 1947 and there was a union for the mine workers. It was very powerful um, and took out uh, the previous conservative government in the 1970s. Uh, there's an individual, Ian McGregor, who ran that board um, and McGregor and Thatcher wanted to close 20 mines then. Um, and cut 20,000 jobs. So again, they are going to go against this National Union of Mine Workers. Uh, many communities would lose their source of income. So this was kind of a, a political battle here. Um, and that union calls for a strike. So what happened? Scabs took over. Uh, they would continue to keep their jobs and, and the mining would have a future. However, um, that coal strike then kind of led to the win to a win by Thatcher McGregor, um, and the strikers give up. The coal industry is then privatized. So the government no longer has to spend money on operating uh, these coal mines. And basically what happened is because the government no longer is operating these, the privatization of them um, kind of led to the closing of mines and a lot of lost jobs there. Uh, you also had a confrontation in the, Falk in the Falklands War. Uh, Argentina invaded a small island here off the coast, um, which was controlled by the UK. Argentina at that time claimed it was theirs along, um, all along, but the UK was kind of the colonists. And it was the colonists who had power, and the UK had power. So it kind of shows a little bit of the global aspect of the UK uh, and some things that the government at this time had to uh, experience and go through. Uh, but then Thatcher kind of had a downfall here. So uh, Thatcher wanted to cut taxes towards the end of her term um, and cut back on property taxes and replace it with what is called a poll tax. 
this was very, very unpopular. Even people within her own party did not like this. Uh, so because this was unpopular, she decided to step down. Was replaced by successor John Major in 1993 to 1997. Uh, and he repealed this poll tax. So after her 11 years or so, uh, some of her policies were kind of getting old. Then Tony Blair is part of the new Labor Party. So the Labor Party was before Thatcher. Now uh, this new ideal, new Labor Party, a little more central, uh, less socialist, um, and a little more popular here. So he uh, positioned himself more like a moderate party so that he can get some more uh, backing. Uh, however, uh, in 2003, when uh, they backed the Iraq war, popularity really slipped. Uh, in 2007, Gordon Brown took over for the Labor Party. So if Gordon Brown, uh, who became uh, prime minister for a few years, cannot really get the public to remain loyal. Again, Iraq was one of the big reasons. And then during his term, uh, the 2008 recession hit. Uh, then we had the 2010 election. We have uh, David Cameron on the Conservative Party. We have Gordon Brown on the Labor Party, and then Nick Clegg, who was a popular Liberal Democrat. Liberal Democrats are, are one of the, uh, at the time, a major third party. Uh, and you can see here that the seats before and the seats won, uh, it was a big change in leadership here. So you have David Cameron, who is the conservative prime minister from 2010-2016. He really um, was energized by a grassroots movement, um, wanted private organizations to help. Um, however, because of the numbers in that election, the conservative party did not reach a majority. In order to control parliament, you have to have a majority. So in order to gain a majority, the Conservative Party joined with the Liberal Democrats and created what is known as a coalition government. This has to be an agreement between two parties. Uh, they then have to agree on all the decisions within Parliament so they don't fall into a vote of no confidence. So as the Conservative parties with the Liberal Democrats become the majority and the Labor Party then became the minority party. Here is an idea that the Liberal Democrats, uh, because they are a third party, always thought would be a good idea for the UK. The UK's voting system is first past the post, where winner takes all in those single member districts. However, because Nick Clegg's Liberal Democrats are a third party, they wanted to use what is known as the alternate vote. Um, it's kind of a proportional representation um, example. Uh, voting. So here's kind of an explanation of how that would work. Queen Lion of the Animal Kingdom is displeased. She recently introduced elections for the office of king using the first past the post voting system. While her realm started out as a healthy democracy with many parties running candidates for king, it quickly devolved into two party rule with the citizens not liking either one, but trapped within the system because of a problem called the spoiler effect. However, one of Queen Lion's subjects from a distant land, Wallaby, has a solution the alternative vote. What's the difference? To find out, let's follow one voter on election day, Red Squirrel, under both systems. There are five candidates running for king, two members of the big parties, Gorilla and Leopard, and three other candidates, Turtle, Owl, and Tiger. Under First Past the Post, Red Squirrel gets a ballot where he picks just one candidate. Red Squirrel really likes Turtle, and even campaigned for him. However, he knows that his new neighbor, Gray Squirrel, is voting Gorilla. And what, starts to wonder Red Squirrel, about all the other animals? Who are they going to vote for? The debates on the Animal News Network only had the big parties, so Red Squirrel thinks it's going to be a close race between Gorilla and Leopard. While he's indifferent toward Gorilla, he's deathly afraid of Leopard. Because he can only pick a single candidate, he gives his one vote to Gorilla in hopes of preventing Leopard from becoming king. This is strategic voting, and it's a necessity under First Past the Post. But now let's look at the alternative vote, which Wallaby explains to Red Squirrel. Instead of picking one, and only one, candidate, he can rank them in order of his most favorite to his least. He goes into the voting booth and gets the same ballot as before, but now puts Turtle as his first choice, Owl as his second, and Gorilla as his third. He dislikes Leopard and Tiger equally, so he stops filling in his ballot and drops it in the box. At this point, Red Squirrel doesn't care exactly what happens. He has other things on his mind, and he heads off. 
but you, dear citizen, want to know how the votes are counted. So here goes. Turtle, beloved though he is with some of the citizenry, comes in last place with only 5%, and he is eliminated from the race. Because the voters rank their candidates in order, we can know what would have happened if Turtle didn't run. Without Turtle, voters like Red Squirrel would have picked Owl instead, so their votes are transferred to her, as though Turtle was never in the race at all. This is why the alternative vote is sometimes called instant runoff voting. It's able to simulate a bunch of elections where the least popular candidate is eliminated after each round, without all the time and expense it would take to run a bunch of campaigns one after another. The alternative vote method keeps eliminating the least popular candidate until someone either wins a majority or only one is left. As no one has a majority yet, the next lowest candidate, Tiger, is eliminated. Tiger voters listed Leopard as their second choice, so she gets Tiger's vote. In the last round, Gorilla is eliminated. Gorilla voters listed Owl as their second choice, so Owl gets those votes, wins a majority, and is crowned king. The alternative vote is a better system because it produces winners that a larger number of voters can agree on. While the alternative vote does have its flaws, it's important to note that any problem AV has, first past the post also shares. They're both susceptible to gerrymandering, they are in proportional systems, they can't guarantee a Condorcet winner, which math geeks hate but there isn't time to explain here, and over time they both trend towards two parties. That being said, alternative vote has a huge advantage that first past the post lacks and makes it mathematically superior. No spoiler effect. Imagine one final election. Two big candidates are running, Gorilla and Leopard, and Leopard looks set to win 55 to 45, but then a third party candidate, Tiger, enters. Tiger manages to convince 15% of the Leopard voters to back him instead. Under first past the post, Gorilla now wins, even though a majority of the voters didn't want him. Under the alternative vote, because all Tiger voters put Leopard as a second choice, Leopard still wins because a majority of the citizens of the Animal Kingdom would rather have her in charge than Gorilla. Using the alternative vote, citizens can help support and grow smaller parties that they agree with, without worrying that they'll put someone they don't like into office. After examining the differences between them, Queen Lion decrees that the alternative vote is to be the rule of the land for electing the king, and everyone is happier. Well, almost everyone. The two big parties can't be as complacent as they used to be, and need to campaign much harder to convince their voters to support them. This has been the alternative vote, explained by me, CGP Gray. Thank you very much for watching. So that's an example of why third parties would want that because the two major parties, again, you could have two major parties and a third party, maybe the third party is stealing some votes, and that major party never gets 50% of the vote, so uh, less than half of the people actually support that party. So this was kind of a way uh, to give a party um, like the Liberal Democrats um, possible more representation and so that the party that becomes Power, more powerful uh, is liked by a majority of the people. All right, so now here is David Cameron, former prime minister, just talking to David Letterman uh, about the UK itself. I ask you a lot of uh, dumb American questions. Far away. <laughs> um, first of all, a rural Britannia. Uh, written by whom? I mean, it's it's the iconic association with the British Empire. Uh, uh, Britain rules the world. Who, who wrote that? Do you know? Um, you're testing me there. Um, <laughs> Elgar, I'll go for. Okay. Edward Elgar? Uh, I reckon. But I, well, we can check it. <laughs> uh, and when we, when we, the designation of British Empire, now in the days of uh, uh, colonization, Britain really did rule the world, didn't they? I mean, it was, the, the sun never set, sets on the British There was Empire. a moment when the globe was like a quarter of Yes, yeah, and that was... Uh, now, did, did, historically, did we look back on that period now as just awful, don't we? I think there was some, there was some, <laughs> there was some good bits, and uh -huh. there were some less than good bits, right. and obviously, you know, we had a bit of a falling out, mm -hmm. right? At that time, and, uh, look, look at the well, I think. I mean, I like to think we're. I, I think we're getting over that. Now. I think so. Uh, yes, uh, uh, and couldn't be more proud. Now, listen, uh, British Empire. Let's go through them. You have England. Yeah. Scotland. It's, the, it's not an empire. This is the United Kingdom. That's I'm sorry. The, right. So, I'm sorry. so think of the think of the United States. Okay. Right. All right. Think United States. I'm sorry. United Kingdom. Okay. You, 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 England. England. Scotland. Scotland. Wales. Wales. Now, what is the deal on Wales? <laughs> 
but it's part of the United Kingdom, right? Uh, but it's, it's a, a, a tiny, small country, is that correct? It's a small country, yes. but a very proud people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how are the Welsh different from the English? Welsh different from the English? Well, there are people in Wales who speak a different language, who speak Welsh as their first language, mm -hmm. uh, but they're very much part of the United Kingdom, so you can think of... Did, now, did, did they vote for you, the, the Welsh people? Some of them did. Um, my party tends to do a little bit better in England than it does in Wales, but... Uh, uh, all right, so... And North, don't forget Northern Ireland. North, Northern Ireland. Now, now, explain for me, I've never been able to hold this in my head, the difference between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Right. Nor Northern Ireland is part of England. Part, no, part of the United Kingdom. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, uh, that's there right, was that's a time, right. There yeah. was a time when all of Ireland was part of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom. There was I then a, a movement for Irish independence, mm -hmm. and when that happened, the north of Ireland decided it wanted to stay with the United Kingdom. So we have the United Kingdom, including Scotland, Wales, England, and Northern Ireland, right. and the Republic of Ireland is a separate country, uh, but with which we United now have, not in the United not Kingdom, in the United no, Kingdom. don't make... No. That mistake, but we have very good relations between the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom. And, and, and is uh, the Ireland, Northern Ireland, the division there is uh, religious? It's it's very complicated. There's a huge amount of history involved in this, uh, partly based on some religious differences. Uh, but the majority of people who live in Northern Ireland, including both Protestants and Catholics, but both want to be a majority, want to be part of the United Kingdom. So we had a big peace agreement which was all about respecting the rights of people in Northern Ireland to determine their own future. And that's the way. And now relations between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland are incredibly good. The Majesty of the Queen visited the Republic of Ireland last year, and it was a really the first time a member of her family had been there since independence. It was a really big moment. And, and as the bonds now between the Republic of Ireland and, and the United Kingdom are very, very strong. All right. Uh, how many people... All right, so there's just a kind of a, a good take on the UK. Uh, the next Prime Minister after David Cameron then uh, was Theresa May. Uh, it says, you know, till present, but uh, actually she has recently stepped down, uh, ran after Cameron, uh, but then resigned because of the Brexit referendum, uh, which is the leaving of the EU. She ran unopposed at that time because she was the leader of the Conservative Party uh, and won. In 2017, Kind of what happened to her, she called for an election um, and she thought this would strengthen her party in the Brexit negotiations. Uh, there wasn't supposed to be an election until 2020, but the Prime Minister can call for an election in 2017. She decided to do so early. Um, she lost the majority and had to then form a coalition, so just like in 2010, but she thought she was going to strengthen the party, she actually weakened it. So the coalition government was created with the Democratic Unionist Party. Uh, they had 317 plus another 10, which is a party from Northern Ireland, to create that coalition. Uh, in 2019, then, um, after she steps down, Boris Johnson was elected as the conservative leader and the prime minister. Uh, conservatives did not hold the majority, but again worked with the U DUP, uh, and parliament was working on a change and some different things over Brexit. Uh, he, he also then called for a snap election. Conservatives were able to win the majority and some more seats, um, and the Labour Party gets about 202 seats. So, again, looking at the idea that Parliament uh, usually is a five-year cycle, but the Prime Minister can call for re-election, especially when there's different negotiations that are going on, maybe they want to strengthen their party, um, and it kind of looks at the failure, too, sometimes of those Prime Ministers.